Hallelujah. I come to bear witness that there is no other God but Jehovah and that Jesus Christ is his only son, a prophet and savior of the world, that there is no other name whereby men shall be saved but by and through the name of Jesus Christ. And at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ the only Son of the most sovereign, omnipotent God is Lord. Grace and mercy to the world and to my kingdom, brothers and sisters. Peace be unto you, and God be glorified. Hallelujah. Before we actually get into the meat of this message, I just want to make sure that the church, Conquerors Christian Center here, has an understanding of what's going on with us as black people in this diaspora and from which we live dealing with our own personal social construct in the United States of America. What I want you to understand is that there's a great push going on now and our president has evoked or has wakened up, if you please, some uh, black people, be it uh, spiritually, be it politically, be it in sports, be it in whatever particular type of move, he has caused uh, an uproar <coughs> in the arena of sports as well as in the arena of the church with white Christian races that are also moving this hateful movement against black folks that's been going on for the last 450 years. But what I want you to understand is that uh, now we have athletes even more uh, moving past Colin Kaepernick uh, as far as not standing for the Star Spangled Banner nor for the flag. At that time, his gesture was merely not to stand because of the injustice that had been uh, uh, moved upon, in particularly African American, or shall I say, black people, especially black males. So he refused to stand. He decided to kneel. And uh, he has been going through a lot of issues with his decision to kneel. Uh, and since then, there's been a lot of chitter-chatter and talk pertaining to the flag as well as the song, the Star Spangled Banner. So I want to keep you in the loop as far as understanding that these are real issues and that these issues are not going to go away because we pretend that they're not issues. So... Uh, the NFL, NBA, and the Major League Baseball are all now in a conundrum of trying to figure out what they're going to do as pertaining to the flag as well as the Star Spangled Banner. So you'll probably see a lot of NFL uh, players not standing today. You'll probably hear a lot of scuttlebuss and a lot of feedback. You'll probably hear a lot of stuff as pertaining to us as black people and owners are not knowing what to do. Uh, some want to take the lead of, our, of President Donald Trump, and some want to just let this problem go away. But I'm here this morning to tell you, and the reason why I, I saw it fitting to share it from the pulpit is because this is a social construct of our people. Remember, God has morphed us into dealing with uh, the kingdom of God as well as the social construct of our people. So you'll probably be hearing a lot more of these type of things that I will be sharing with you, that we as a people have to move strong, fast, and begin to anchor ourselves in our own economics as we deal with building the kingdom of God. So what I want to share with you this morning, for those of you that are going to hear this CD, the reason why uh, Colin Kaepernick decided not to, to stand was because of the issues in America's cities. Black males being gunned down. We recently had one over in St. Louis where they had him on tape. He even confessed the fact that uh, he was going to kill this black male, and he went out and did it, and he was found not guilty. So uh, the quest for freedom, or shall we say the reach for freedom, is still on. The struggle is still intense. But here's the reason why I think now, my own personal opinion, I know people are grown, they can do what they want to do, uh, but I, I personally find it difficult to, to stand um, for 
the Star Spangled Banner as well as the National Anthem. I'm saying me. You're grown. You can do what you want to do. So don't leave here saying Pastor Curry said, don't stand for the National Anthem. Don't leave here lying on me saying, uh, you know, uh, don't stand uh, for the American flag. That is not what I'm saying. I said through my own personal conviction and the thing that I know now about the flag even more, as well as the Star Spangled Banner, I, I, I find it difficult for me to stand, okay? And here's the reason why. There was a man by the name of Francis Scott Keyes. Francis Scott Keyes, who wrote, he's the writer of the Star Spangled Banner, celebrating slavery in the original lyrics. And the lyric says, the land of the free don't really apply to the millions of people who were slaves. The song was a poem. It took close to 117 years before it became our national anthem, 117 years before they decided to make it our national anthem. I, I would challenge you to look up Francis Scott Keyes and you'll get a good feel of how he uh, decided to write this anthem. You see, the third stanza uh, of, of the national anthem, a few people have heard, have uh, basically have never heard it, openly celebrate the murder of slaves. Let me say that again. The third stanza, a few people have heard, openly celebrate the murdering of slaves. And here's that stanza. He says, no refuge could save the harlings and slaves from the terror of the fight or the gloom of the grave. And the star-spangled banner in triumph does wave. And that is part of the reason why that uh, a lot of uh, athletes will not be standing, and that's reason why that I won't stand, and I know there are people saying, well, you stood before, but how many know that when a revelation of some injustice have came, when you now know, you've heard us say many times, when you know right, you should do what? You should do right. So I know better, and I'm deciding not to. Now, I'm not going to blatantly disrespect it, but I would just uh, remain in my seat. Amen? Okay. Also, the Declaration of Independence was written in 1776. And it says, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. I can go on. And during that time, we was right smack in the middle of slavery. The Constitution was also written in 1787, at which time blacks was right in the middle of slavery. So many of these documents that we have now, as black people begin to unpack them and look at them closely, are now awakening to the fact that we not only were not free then, but we are still not free. And as a result of that, many are beginning to cry out, and the trumpet is sounding for freedom in every area of our lives. So I just want to share that with you. So when you see this stuff on television and you see it, athletes speaking up, that's merely because that they have bumped into truth. And truth pressed to the earth shall rise again and no lie will live forever. So don't get mad. You know, just understand what's going on. And uh, if you decide that that's what you want to do, that's totally your decision. But uh, I can't do it anymore. Amen. Hallelujah. Now, I know if you're at work and you're at school and you got people around you that's paying your bills and, and stuff like that, you may be a little apprehensive. But uh, I don't have to worry about that, okay? So trust your own judgment. Uh, navigate through the waters as you see fit. But just know that's why they're not standing. Amen? Hallelujah. Let's go to Proverbs chapter 1. And we'll read verse 1. Then the following scripture would be Proverbs chapter 22, reading verse 10. And therewith, I will extract my text. Proverbs chapter 1, reading, I mean Psalms chapter 1. Psalms chapter 1, I'm sorry about that. Psalms chapter 1, verse 1, Proverbs chapter 22, verse 10. Psalms chapter 1, verse 1, read, it says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, 
nor stand in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. Okay, let's go to Proverbs 22 and 10. And it reads, it says, cast out the scorner and contention shall go out. Yea, strife and reproach shall cease. And I'm going to use for text this morning as we continue in the final of this food series. And my text this morning is the mocking and God denying food. The mocking and God denying fools. We are in a time now where people have made everything where they want to mock and laugh and they want to do all kind of crazy stuff in the body and everything's funny until they come around to they get that diagnosis. And what I've discovered over the years that the mocking and God denying fool is all in the church. And we're going to unpack this in a way where I hope you can be to get a greater understanding that the kingdom of God is nothing to play with. The kingdom of God is nothing to laugh at. You don't, you don't get to laugh at things. And I know there are some that still believe in that you can joke and tell lies and as long as people are laughing and, and they even have church comedians and, and sometimes they're telling jokes and laughing and mocking and all of it lies. Uh, you know, they call them back then, they call them fools. And a fool was considered a clown. So let's unpack this and see what God's word says about it. Okay. The word let's or letsing. That's L-E-T-Z, let's. How do you pronounce that? Let's, I got it right. If my daughter said that's it, that's it. <laughs> the word let's, uh, this word means scoffer, okay? Or it means scorner. Scoffer, scorner, it's a Hebrew word, let's. Uh, it also means a mocker. In modern Hebrew, the word for clown is letzen. That's L-E-T-Z-A-N. Is that correct? Letzen. Okay, he's a clown. He's a letzen. The letz is a master of clowning. Okay? I've come to understand that everything ain't always funny. But see, a lesson will always try to make something funny that was never intended to be funny. And sometimes people will make something funny because they say, let's take the edge off of it. Sometimes you got to laugh about some things. But, but the purpose of the let's and the lesson was all designed to go against the kingdom. When the let's came in, he came in to make fun of preachers to make fun of the sages. When he showed up, he was a master clown. See, Alex is also an arrogant person, very arrogant. Did you not know that most of the people that like the clown, they clown or they become the clown to take the pressure off themselves? And it's been reported that most people that, that love comedy, especially sometimes comedians, and I'm not knocking comedians if they just drive in their lane, but when it comes to the kingdom of God, many of them are so arrogant and some of them can be so depressed. Have you ever seen a comedian that when, when you say something that he think is funny, but you don't, and he looking for a laugh when ain't nobody laughing? In other words, they didn't get the punchline. So sometimes people like that can go into vast depression because their whole thing is about making people laugh. It's mockery. Well, we live in a time now where the church is being laughed at. The church is being laughed at by these arrogant clowns. They are proud. They are sneering. 
The word steering means to express derision, which means they, they're laughing and expressing very, very wicked things. It's kind of like someone get happy when you do bad. Someone start laughing when you fall down. Sneering. Someone laugh when you make a mistake. We got these lats sometimes that they'll laugh when you mispronounce a word. It becomes funny to them. That's the lats. A person that is a clown, you know, they're looking for things to laugh at. They're arrogant. They're very proud. They are sneering. And they're very disruptive. You see, a lats love to ridicule and poke fun at God good and holy people. You need to get this now. A let will find something wrong about a man of God and make fun about it. A let, these master clowns, will always look for something in the church that may be deficient. They always look around to try to find your weakness and then they make an issue out of it. That's what a let does. These are some of the same people that was talking to Jesus and putting Jesus down, and, and they was looking for ways to antagonize Jesus. These are these clowns that would follow Jesus around trying to find out when is he going to mess up. These arrogant, proud clowns many times come into church and look for things to talk about. They come into church, look for ways to defeat the kingdom of God. And they do it through sneering, and they do it through clowning. They do it through disrupting. Anything that's right and moving in the right direction, the let's is trying to find a way to mess it up. These arrogant clowns are looking for your failure. And that's what they did to Jesus. They was trying to tell Jesus, what, uh, how are you going to build this temple in three days? They were so arrogant until they didn't realize he was talking about himself. They were so arrogant until they didn't realize that he was talking to them spiritually, but they were talking to him physically. Are you communicating with somebody with spiritual conception, and they're hearing you physically? These lets will take any mistake you make and laugh about it. They laugh at you. They like to poke fun at you. And they love to do it with, with people that say they're saved. If you, at times, watch people that laugh at you when you make a mistake and you really observe them, that's a let's. Why? Because they really get excited when you do it. Especially, have you ever been around someone as a preacher, a pastor, a bishop, or minister, and, and you know your authority that you have? You know what God has put into you and how you're supposed to conduct yourself. But as soon as you slip, as soon as you make a mistake, them lets come in for the kill. Are oh, you supposed to be a pastor? I thought you was a minister. That's what a let's would do. I thought you was a minister. I thought you understood that. That's what I'm talking about, these hypocrites. A let's is always looking to come to shame you to ridicule you. These proud, bodacious clowns, the Letsons, are packing our church today. They're trying to find holes in your garments. They're looking for wrinkles in your conversation. They're looking to see when you're going to fall. They're looking at your families, where he's supposed to be a preacher, why this ain't working. She supposed to be a preacher. Why that ain't working? These lets and they're, they're looking. They, they have magnifying glasses trying to find to see if you are as what you say you are. These are some lessons that, that show up to church on every Sunday morning, looking around, looking for mistakes. These are people that don't really believe that you can be holy. They believe that you are striving for, but they don't believe you can walk it out. Why? Because they can't walk it out. These are arrogant, proud clowns. Can everybody say clowns? 
You see, a lesson is a debunker. He is a troublemaker. He ignites controversy. He loves to insult others. That's just who he is. Let me say that again. He's a debunker. So if truth is coming, well, the reason why I didn't do this here lesson, no, no, that ain't it. You know, you just lying. He, he's a debunker. He's a troublemaker. They come to churches and start trouble. Then they sit back and watch the fallout of the trouble. The, and they laugh. And, and they love to laugh. And see, I told you, ain't nobody perfect. See, I told you that church ain't what they say it is. That's what a lesson does. He, he's a clown. He's proud. He's arrogant, sneering, disruptive. A debunker a troublemaker. He insults others. Let's go to Proverbs chapter 22. He insults others. As we read verse 10, Proverbs chapter 22, reading verse 10, and listen to what it says. It says, cast out the scorner. That's the let's. And contention will go out. You get rid of that scorner, that lets, that clown, then the fighting going to stop. Then it says, yea, strife and reproach will cease. So a lot of churches are filled up with a bunch of clowns. They don't come to church to get to know God. They come to church to see what's happening. They come to church to see what Sister Lula may have on the day how they can make fun of her. They come to church to see what the pastor going to talk about, what the bishop going to talk about. They come to church to see how perfect the choir going to be. You know how they sit back in the corner like they're writing stuff down and laughing because the choir is off key or laughing because uh, sister so-and-so got a funny shout or laughing because brother so-and-so, they already know when he's going to begin to praise God, laughing in the church at people that are coming to church. These are lessons. These are clowns. They are proud clowns that are packing churches out. And we even have preachers operating that way, trying to outdo other preachers, talking crazy about preachers saying, I thought he knew that some and don't seem like he even prepared. These are lessons. These are clowns. These are fools that come in a church. Jesus struggled with it because they was always trying to, to trap Jesus up in the paralysis of analysis. Whenever he began to speak, there were some lessons out there. These clowns looking for Jesus to fall down. The woman with the issue of blood pressed through the crowd. And when she pressed through the crowd, she touched the hem of Jesus' garments. And some of, them, some of the people that was around him said, uh, Jesus said, who touched me? And some of them said, well, we are being thrown on every side. Jesus, how are you going to dare to ask us who touched you? You see, when you touch God the right way through faith, something leaves Jesus. When you touch him the right way, so Jesus knew virtue was drawn from me. But then there will be others saying, oh, he's just talking crazy. Uh, nothing really happened, but the woman uh, bowed down, and he began to bless her, and, and he said, through thy faith thou shalt be whole. But see, a let's a take that and look at it with, that's stupid. That doesn't make sense. These are proud clowns. When Jesus was at the well with the woman, there's some let's would say, what you doing hanging out with this single woman? Yes, yeah, she married. She had five husbands and the one is not hers. What are you doing hanging out with a married woman? Not a single one, but a married one. Why are you with her? A let's would take that and laugh at it and make it look like it's something bad. The Bible tells us to let not our good be evil spoken of. Are you a person that go to church just to see? Or you go to church just to experience? Your church attendance should be about your experiencing the power of God for you on this day. What experience did you get? Is it just checking the box? 
Are you going to see how many people showed up Sunday? Maybe you go back home and say, there was only a few there. But as long as you was there, that's God, all God is concerned about. But a let would take things like that and laugh at it and make fun of it. That's what they'll do. These are some proud clowns. And they start looking for ways to bring the house of God down. Let's consider something else. God will get the last word on these repugnant clowns. He's going to get the last word. So you can laugh now, but you will pay later. These repugnant clowns, he will get the last word. You see, a let's, he is a proud marker. That means that he will mark you and talk bad about you, and then he want to get other people to join in and talk about you. I don't know about you, but I've been to churches where you have people that merely come to see what's going on. They're not trying to establish no relationship with Jesus Christ. They're not trying to really get to know anybody in the church. They're just coming to see what's going on. They're called spectators. They're called people that just attend. They're called herders. They get herd in, but they're not really a part of what God is doing. Therefore, they sit back and take pot shots. They take pot shots at people that are really trying to live for Christ. These are the less. These are these repugnant clowns. They are better known as fools. So you have these lets with scrupulous marking attitude, which means that they don't just stop marking. They continue to mark you until they get home. And one thing that I discover about lets, they don't just go home and talk bad about you. When they're in the mall, they talk bad about you. When they meet people, they talk bad about you. Have you ever heard heard one of these lets? You know, they come to you real serious And they say, well, uh, you still go to that church? That's a let's. That's a clown. That's a person that really, really, really don't like the things of God, and they look for ways to bring the things of God down. It's like, like, why you still going there? They ain't got no big choir. They ain't got this. But we can't deny the word. And, And people will come around you and ask you, Crazy question like, you still go there or are you still believe in what, the, what that church is doing or that church is doing? And, and then they start laughing. And when you begin to tell people, well, I used to go there, I don't go no more, then you just turn that clown on. Then that clown, girl, I used to go there too and da 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 And it's all about people. It's never about God. So these clowns always go against God, but they like to go against God through putting down or dogging people. That's when you know you're dealing with a clown because they're going to put down God by putting down people. They're going to put down God by putting down people. And when you're around these repugnant clowns, all you have to do is just tell them, yes, I still go, I love God, and uh, I'm doing the work of the kingdom. And then you'll notice on their face they will get mad. I've seen it a bunch of times where people have brought me garbage, and the garbage that they bring me about someone else, I start to speak nice about that person. That's the only way you can get these repugnant clowns to get out your business, is when they bring up something bad about someone, you start talking good about them. They can't handle that, because see, a let's want you to laugh with him about them. How many hear what God is telling you? You see, this clown, the let's, provides one of the greatest challenges for the sages, our pastors today. He's one of our greatest challenges because all the work as a pastor does or a minister does in the church, a let's, as soon as he leave the service, a let's will go out and talk about it. Sometimes the reason why churches doesn't grow like they should grow is because there are a lot of people outside of the doors that are putting the man of God down, the church down, and everything that the church stands for down. There are people out there that are running their mouths so bad about a church until few people just trickle in. 
And then when they trickle in, then they go back out, and they don't have nothing bad to say, but the let's continue to come to them and tell them, girl, that church should have been grown by now. That church should have did this here. And those are these repugnant clowns. They love coming to church based upon how big it is. They love coming to church based upon how many, how many programs you have. They don't come to church for the word. And that's why God told me long time ago, we're not into performance, we're into the word of God. And we're going to preach, teach the word of God with whatever God brings on Sunday morning. You see, I don't know who's going to show up on Sunday morning. All I know that if God give me breath and give my wife breath, I already know that we're going to be here. So it, it, it's not about anything else but about a relationship with God. And if you allow these repugnant clowns to keep you out of the house of God because they're sneering and they're laughing at a particular thing that goes on in the church, that should be the indicator to you that they are not children of God. They're of another kingdom, and that kingdom is the kingdom of Satan. You see, the enemy is always trying to rebuff the church. He's always trying to keep the church from being what it needs to be. He's always coming at the body of Christ and body of believers. He want to laugh at you. You're thinking it's just about the church or shall we say the pastor or the location, but he want to laugh at you. He want to ridicule you. He want to bully you. He want to tell you you're wasting your time. You're going someplace and they ain't dealing with nothing. They ain't, ain't nothing going on over there. But as long as you know in your heart of hearts that your relationship with God is solid, your relationship with God is grounded, and that you are feeding the sick, that you are literally going to visit those that are in the hospital, that you're literally doing the work of the kingdom, that you're literally trying to help somebody in your heart of hearts, a lesson these proud clowns cannot get to you. They can't get to you because you know it ain't funny. They only get to people that are weak, that really haven't made a decision to go with God. They love to find these weak folks and laugh at them. I don't know about you, but when I was growing up, I was bullied and I was laughed at. And there's nothing worse to be than being bullied by someone that's bigger than you, older than you, because you can't really do too much about it. And laugh at you, talk about you, treat you bad. Well, sometimes the same thing goes on in the house of God. We don't see it. We don't hear about it because most people that are bullied in the church don't say much. Wives being bullied by the husband, husband being bullied by the wives, deacons being bullied by ministers, ministers being bullied by the pastor, pastor being bullied by the bishop. The whole church is being bullied going through a power conundrum where everybody's trying to fight for themselves. And as a result of that, all we have is these lessons laughing. I can recall a few years ago that when people would get up and worship God and praise, if a woman's skirt wasn't right or something like that, you have people laughing at that. The church is not a laughing matter. See, when you really love someone, you pull them to the side and say, hey, you know, your, you know, your skirt is, is not like it need to be. You know, you don't laugh at someone that don't have their stuff together. You don't laugh at someone because they're not looking as perfect as you think they should do. The church is, in many cases, filled up with sneering people, proud people that think they're better than everybody else. They're called letson, these proud clowns that love to laugh at what goes on in the church. Something else I want you to understand is this. Whenever you see somebody laughing at a pastor, laughing at a minister, or laughing at a teacher, that's a lesson. If he make a mistake or she make a mistake, that is not the time to laugh. When you laugh, that shows your immaturity. You should be praying. Anytime a pastor is preaching, you should be praying that the word of God will come out clear and precise with understanding. Anytime someone is teaching you the word of God, your prayer should be God help them to teach it like it needs to be taught. Anytime you see a preacher on television that may be saying something that you may not particularly agree with, that's not the time to become a lesson. That's the time to say, Holy Spirit, give him revelation. Holy Spirit, we are supposed to drive the preachers to preach what God want them to preach. 
We're not supposed to laugh at them. We're not supposed to ridicule them. We're not supposed to get back in the, in the back and begin to laugh at them because then we become the fools that we're laughing at. We have to decide that we're going to get involved in the sermon. Now, how do you get involved in the sermon? You get involved in the sermon that when a preacher is preaching to you, you're praying, Heavenly Father, continually to help him get that word out. Feed us, Lord. Feed us, Lord, through a man or woman of God. That's what got to be your prayer. Not as soon as something happened that throws you off, now you, <laughs> you know, and giggly, giggly, giggly. You're laughing at a man or woman of God, and how you think God is going to be happy with you. You don't laugh when it's bodacious mistakes. You pray that God will correct the pastor or the ministers or anyone else, not just me, but anyone, anyone else. You need to be praying that the word will come out with clarity, simplicity, and understanding. How many got that? Hallelujah. Now, on the other hand, you have another Hebrew word that is called Nabal, N-A-B-A-L, Nabal. This word, which also means fool. So remember, we have the let's, the clown, and now we have the nabel, uh, which is a Hebrew word, which means fool. This is a God-denying fool, a nabel. You'd be shocked at the people that come to church but really don't believe in God. I know that sounds like an oxymoron, but it's true. They come to church, but they really don't believe in the power of Jesus Christ. They come to church, but they really don't believe in it. They have a relationship with God. These are the Nabels. They, these are the God-denying fools. Remember I told you the text this morning is the mocking and God-denying fool. So we have the clown and the God-denying fool. The clown, and the, you know, always want to laugh. Now, it, it's, it, it's sad when you're a clown and you don't believe in God. But you come to church all the time. We're in that season where people just don't, don't really, really believe in God. But there are 10 church. It's kind of like one of these days I hope it happens. Well, I don't believe in him today, but one of these days, maybe I believe in him. Maybe something's going to happen, and God show me a sign, and Lord God, you know, show me you're real. And so they come to church, but yet in their heart, they're denying the very God that they claim to come and worship. These are the Nabels. These, these are the fools. Let's take a closer look at this Nabel. I believe I got it right which means a fool, also a God-denying fool. The word occurs but three times in Proverbs 14. Let's go to Proverbs 14. We'll read verse 1 through 7. These Nabels, these God-denying fools. And they're packing churches out. They have no conscience. They can come to church and Hear the preacher preach and lead the service and go straight to the club. Lead the church and go straight to the club and drink all the alcohol and do their thing, but in their heart, you know, they, they nowhere near believe that there's a God. They just believe that, uh, you know, they can get what they want, but they don't really believe in God. Proverbs chapter 14 is what I said, I believe. Let's read verse 1 down through 7, and it reads, it says, Every wise woman build her house, but the foolish pluck it down with her hands. He that walketh in his uprightness fears the Lord, but he that perverse his ways despises him. In the mouth of the foolish is a rod of pride. There it is. In the mouth of the foolish is a rod of pride, but the lips of the wise shall preserve them. Where no oxen are, the crib is clean, but much increase is by the strength of an ox. A faithful witness will not lie, but a false witness will utter lies. A scorner seek wisdom and findeth is not. 
but knowledge is easy unto him that understand it. Go from the presence of a foolish man. Now, that's what the word is telling you. Go from the presence of a foolish man when thou perceive not in him the lips of knowledge. There are some people you just got to walk away from. And a lot of times we think these people are outside the church. A lot of times we look at the world as being the fool. We look at the world as having all the characteristics of the fool. But how many of you know that there are a lot of fools in the church? A lot of fools in the church. And they, they come to church to show you how foolish they are. Remember I told you we got the young and old fool? How many remember him? The young and old fool, you got the open fool. I'd rather have an open fool because at least I know he's trying to learn something. And then from the open fool, we have the, the hardened fool. This is an old fool that just ain't trying to learn nothing. He's a hardened fool. And now we're dealing with the God-denying fool and the let's, the clown that is a fool. So what does God want us to do as believers when it comes to the church? The only thing a fool can do for you is to become wise. You see, the Nebel must become wise. Somebody said, well, how does that happen? It happened by listening to the sages or listening to the heart, listening to the people and the pastors and ministers. That's how he can get himself together by becoming wise. You see, uh, it is the fool that has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that does good. See, a fool going to always say there is no God. So ask yourself the question. Are you surrounded by people that attend church but really don't believe in God? Now, this is a deep question. This is where critical thinking comes in at. Because some people will come to church on the pretense that maybe I believe in God one day. Now, the question is, how do you know when somebody really believes in God? Because everything they're doing is centered around God. When they wake up in the morning, they have devotions. Before they get on the highway or on the train, they pray. While on the train, they're praying. When they get to work, they're praying, Heavenly Father, help me to have a great day. When they're walking to the halls and work or going different places, their relationship with God. I used to do it all the time that every time when I was at work and went to the bathroom, there was a prayer room for me. Every time I went to the restroom, I prayed. So I was praying several times a day. Why? If you're a real believer, God is the centerpiece of your life. If you're a real believer, God is the centerpiece of your life. You will never, ever, ever put anything before God. If you're a real believer, you, you look at your calendar and you plan your events based upon what's going on in the church. Meaning that you don't plan your events to, to go against what's going on in the church. You plan your events based upon what's going on in the church which means that you're putting the kingdom of God before yourself. That's when you really know if somebody believing in God or not. But when you're putting everything before God, not only are you telling others, but you're telling God and yourself that he is not first in your life. All you got to do is just show me what you do. If I look at your ledger and I look at your checkbook, I can see either you're a believer or you're not. It's not, it's, it's, you can't have it both ways. You either believe God or you don't. It's no such thing as that I believe him sometimes. No, you believe him or you don't. Do you breathe sometimes? No, you, believe, you breathe all the time. You have to make it up in your mind who you're with. So there are a lot of people that come to church but really do not believe in God. They like to make you think they do, but in their hearts they don't. Jesus said it this way. He said, uh, you say with your mouth that you love me, but your heart is far away from me. Today in the body of Christ, we have a form of godliness 
But many believers deny the power because we have these God-denying fools and we have these lets, the nebel, and the lets and the nebel, the clown and the God-denying fool. They both attend church and they begin to spread their poison all over the church. And before you know it, people that was really rooted in God are no longer rooted anymore. People that was really serious about the things of God have become casual. People that was really, I'm going to church no matter what, show up whenever they feel like it. You see, when you really, really anchored in God, no devil in hell can pull you out of the church. If you believe it, act like you believe it. If you really anchored in God, can't nobody stop you from coming to church. Can't, if you really anchored in prayer, can't nobody stop you from praying. If you really anchored in the things of God, no devil in hell can pull you out. But I believe that we have a lot of people that have never been anchored. They've never had a relationship with God. They've been pretending for so long until they pretend and deceive themselves. They like for you to think that they're good Christians, but in their heart they know that, you know what, I haven't really accepted Jesus as my personal Savior. That was a preacher, I believe, was preaching for more than, I think, 30 years. And he was never saved. He was busy winning people to Christ, but he never confessed Christ as his personal Savior. You see, a lot of times, you can be denying God while at the same time acting like you're reaching for him. Now, that is an oxymoron. You can be denying God but acting like you're reaching for him. What does that mean? You can be reaching for God but denying him in your heart. It's like you can have a smile on your face but murder in your heart. That's why when God looks at men and women, he goes from the inside first. He said, you praise me with your mouth, but your heart is far away from me. That's a God-denying fool. That's a let's see. He, he's a clown. He's a God-denying fool. Let's go to Psalm chapter 10. We have all of these people packing churches that really don't know God. They never had a relationship with God. And that's why many times... You know, uh, when they're gone, nobody miss them because uh, they're never there anyway in their heart. Psalms 10, verse 4, it reads, it says, The wicked, through the pride of his countenance, that's his face, will not seek after God. God is not in all his thoughts. We need to read that again. The wicked, verse 4, Psalms 10, verse 4. The wicked through the pride of his countenance, he's arrogant, he's proud, will not seek after God. He's not going to seek after God. He's not going to do it. The scripture says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. Blessed is he that seeketh for righteousness. It's Matthew chapter 5. See, a wicked man ain't going to seek after God. He, he's not going to try to get to know God better. He's not going to surrender his ways. He's not going to do it. He's a Nabal, and, and, and he hang around the lips, and the Nabal and the lips just laugh about God and become clowns while denying God. He really don't want to know God. God is not in his thoughts. If you can have a conversation with someone for, for five minutes and, and the word of God doesn't come up, you know God is not in his thoughts. I can't talk to people more than five minutes without God coming out some kind of way. The word of God is going to show up. But if he's not in your thoughts, then you're a person they like to pretend. In other words, you get out in the world and you get to places where the world is at and all of a sudden you never bring up God. You hit the mute button because you want everybody to think that you're like them. These are these Nebels or Nabels. They, 
They are people that profess Christ but really don't believe. You've heard me say over the years, these are unbelieving believers. They don't really believe. Well, how do you know they don't believe? Just watch what they do. Watch what they do, not what they say. Watch what they do. If you're thirsty, ain't nobody going to keep you from water. But if you don't believe you're thirsty, you'll live life and be dried up and think you're okay. When you really love God, he'll never be second in your life. I say when you really love him. There are some things that have to be put on the back shelf. And I'm so thankful to God that God taught me this early. I learned this early, that the kingdom is first. Did I fall down sometime? Of course I did. Did I make dumb, stupid mistakes? Of course I did. But even when I fell down, even when I made dumb, stupid mistakes, he was always in my thoughts. So are you seeking God? Are you around people that seek God? Are you looking for God to help you? Is God in the major part of your decision? Are you putting God second, third, and fourth? That's a Nabal. Where you say, well, I love the Lord, but you're denying him. See, what I want you to understand, you can't have it both ways. You can't say, I love the Lord and God is first in my life, but you ain't seeking him. How many of you have had a $100 bill and let's say you lost that $100 bill? You, you, you open up your wallet and you thought you had put the money back in and the $100 bill didn't go in and you went back in your pocket because you thought about something else and you looked in it and you noticed your $100 wasn't in it and the wind took your $100, let's say about 20 feet away from you. How many is going to be seeking that $100? You're going to look north, south, east, west. You're going to get on your knees. You're going to crawl so much, look underneath cars. You're going to be looking, anybody walk by, you see $100? You're going to be doing all of that. You're going to get mad. You're going to get so frustrated. And, and you're going to be looking everywhere for that $100. You're going to do a circumference around that area for at least 20, 30, 40, 50 yards. And if anybody walked by, you're going to think in your head, they got your money. Holler back if you hear me. That's called somebody seeking that $100 bill. You got to seek God the same way you seek some money. You got to be real about seeking God. You can't say you're seeking God and you're casually doing the thing that you wouldn't do if you was trying to find that $100 bill. Jesus said it this way, and ye shall know them by their fruit. And what are the fruit? The fruit are the thing that you do. Your behavior, your behavior becomes the fruit. You got root, fruits, and shoots. Roots, shoots, and fruits. The root is the branch. I mean, the root is the root of the tree. The shoot is the branch and the fruit and the fruit is what comes off of the tree. When you're seeking God, I'm talking about really seeking God, there's something in you that will not rest if you haven't had your mind on God. You start to feel funny on the inside. You can read a hundred books, but somewhere along the line, the Holy Spirit is going to say, get to the Bible, get to the Bible. Your thoughts will go to God. So when you have people where churches always last, I begin to question, do you really believe? I begin to question, do you really believe? Because if you really believe... It will never be last because it's a part of who you are. It's like my lungs cannot say, you know what, uh, I don't need no air today. My lungs can't say, you know what, hold up on the air today, God. I'll holler back at you in about three weeks. 
My lungs cannot operate without air. How many hear what God is telling you? They can't operate without air. Just like you cannot operate without your relationship with God through Jesus Christ. It's no such thing as that I get to it next week. I talk to God next, you know, I pray when it's, a, when it's an emergency. When you really are sold out for God, it's like lungs in air. They need one another. Do you really need God or are you pretending like you do? Are you showing up to church, but in your heart you really don't believe? And I'm going to suggest to you, that's why a lot of prayers don't get answered because God said, you ain't with me. You are not with me. You are depending on yourself. You are depending on what you can do, who you know, your connection. He said, you're not with me because if you were with me, I would hear from you more often. It's kind of like people that say, well, you know, uh, you heard me say years ago when somebody got to tell you a thousand times they love you, the issue is not you, it's them. <laughs> That's called speaking from an overexemplified disposition. I'm trying to convince myself that I love you. But someone that really loves you, they don't have to tell you that every day. They show it to you by what they do. If you're telling me you love me, but I never get a call from you. You're telling me you love me, but you never drop by. You're telling me you love me, but you don't do things like you should do for me. You're telling me you love me, but you give me stupid, crazy gifts. Dumb, stupid, crazy things. But that's supposed to be your love. When you really love someone, you give them your all. You call them. You be around them. You show them that you care about them. That's love. The word of God says in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's love. Love is always giving. And love is giving of your best and not your rest. You don't have a chance to say, well, I get to God when I get to him. When you love God, whenever the doors open, you're supposed to be in. That's love. And that's why I question sometimes, do people really, are they really saved? <laughs> people that come to church, are they really saved? That's why we have this great falling away. I'm here to tell you sometimes, it's not a great falling away. They was never there. <laughs> you can't leave when you've never been there. You can't be committed to something that you was never committed to. So you don't show up. That means you were never here to begin with. Are you mad at God? That means you have never settled it in your heart that Jesus Christ is your Savior and God is your Father. You have never settled it. Preachers quit him because it get tough. A preacher should never quit when it get tough because if he's rooted, that simply means that whoever he is, God got him. But if you're quitting and, and you're running away, that means you would never call. You've heard me say a thousand times, your calling will prove you. God knows those that are his. Holla back. He knows those that are his. He knows his children. My children hear my voice and a stranger they will not follow. If God is in you and you in God, he'll never be second. I'd rather be dead and buried in my grave than to put God, put anything before my relationship with God. And I'm not a perfect man. I have many flaws. I have many flaws, but I got enough sense to understand that I have the grace to work through them. I have the grace to line it up. I have the grace to get my life right. I have the grace, the grace of God to be all that I need to be. So when I fall down, I know my faith, my hope in God will bring me back up. So the fundamental question is, are you really saved? Because if you're saved, there's certain things you just can't do. You can't keep missing church like something is wrong with the people that are worrying about you. And you're getting mad when people ask about you. 
I'm grown. Why you always asking if I'm coming to church or not? I'm grown. People ask about you because they love you. And they don't want your life to be a mess. The danger comes is when they stop asking about you. Because, see, God will sometimes tell, God will put some mute button on certain people and say, leave them alone. I got him. That's what he did with Samson. He said, don't worry about him. I got him. He don't want to pay attention. Leave him alone. You see, when people are inquiring about you, asking about you, that's God showing his love towards you. But when the faucet turns off, then it's you and the devil because God will use the devil to chasten you. That's why I don't worry about people when they don't come to church, don't show up, act like they doing God a favor. And they say, well, you know, one of these days I show up, stay at home, sleep. Go to the movies, do your thing. Do your thing. That's act a fool. Because when God stepped back from you, the devil already know he's one of mine anyway. And all of a sudden, all hell will break loose in your life. Now you're crying. Now you're running to the church. Snot coming all out your nose. And you're running here. Oh, there's nobody around. No, 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 no. You, you know, who you with? <laughs> That's the first question we got to ask. Am I wasting time praying for you? Are you really saved? Let's start there. Let's, let's make sure you saved first. I would suggest to you there are hundreds of people in churches all over America that have never confessed Christ as their personal Savior. Hundreds. Thousands. All you have to do is see their life from Monday through Saturday. Therein is the indicator. A knee bell. The knee bell is a fool who is devoid of spiritual understanding. He has no spiritual perception. He has a closed mind to God's ideas. That's a knee bell. Remember, he is arrogant. He's void. He's devoid of under spiritual understanding, which means that you can preach to him for 25 years, and, and, and he'll probably pick it up on the 24th year. He's devoid of understanding. He thinks you're picking on him when you're preaching about the righteousness of God and how he needs to be more righteous so that God can use him. He's very arrogant. That's a knee bell. He's proud. Go to Proverbs 17, read verse 7. Proverbs 17, read in verse 7, it says, Excellent speech becometh not a fool, much less do lying lips a prince. Excellent speech becomes not a fool. In other words, a, spoo, a, a fool, a nebel, do not know how to speak. Have you ever talked to someone that thought they was very intelligent and, and they done went through about 15 subjects and none of them made sense? It kind of goes like this here. Well, I know about salvation. I know I'm saved because I got baptized. And after I got baptized, my mom and my grandmama and them, they took me to over to the other place. And when I got over there, you know, they told me I got to get baptized again. So I got baptized over there. Then they told me to go over here. But then I, you know, then the preacher asked me, was I saved? I said, I don't know because I have been to four or five churches. And I got baptized in all those churches. But I'm not really sure that I'm saved. I want to be saved. I believe the Lord loved me. And, and you know, that's a person that... That's a knee bell. He, he, he don't know what he don't know. And since he don't know what he don't know, he's denying God. You know, it, he's an ignorant fool. Do you know him? He, he, he don't have excellent speech and, and he lies all the time. You see, the knee bell, this knee bell, this God denying fool, also known as an atheist. So if you want to uh, conceptualize the knee bell, just... Just rank him with the atheist. He, he loves to talk about there is no God, but when trouble comes, he said, God help me. Isn't that amazing? You know how some of the most wicked people, when they're going through something and they know they can see a sense that is about to end, they scream out, help, Lord. 
you know. But, but, but an atheist, by the mere fact that he says he don't believe in God, is an indicator that he do, because how can you, can, how can you b not believe in something that you declare that you not believe in? It's like me saying I don't believe in water, but I drink it all the time. See how stupid that is. So an atheist will always, if you want to get an atheist, well, how can you say you don't believe in something that you declare that you don't believe in? The mere fact you don't believe in him shows that he exists. I don't believe in wearing shoes, but I got some on. <laughs> so it, it, he, he speaks against the opposite of what he said. He's making a declaration statement, and all he's saying that I'm proud, I'm arrogant, and I choose not to believe in a God. That's the Nebel. He, he's in proud, arrogant fool. See, so when, when the Let's, the master clown, meets with the Nebel, the God-denying fool, all you will get is laughter and clowning. All you will get is laughter and clowning. And they love to laugh at what God is doing and what he has not done. These are the church major fools. Now, you're gonna, when you go to different churches, you're going to look and see things a little bit different because everybody that's laughing ain't laughing with you. They're laughing against you. These fools must be reminded in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, it says, but without faith... It is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a reward of them that diligently seek him. So when you bring a let's and a nebel together, you're going to get some clowning and some God denying answers. These are the fools. They have no faith. They laugh at God. They talk about God. And most importantly, they talk about the children of God. They talk about the men of God. They make jokes about the men and women of God. And they deny that God even exists. And they come to church. They pack out churches but still don't believe in God. They show up every Sunday morning but don't believe that God can heal them. They show up all the time. They read their Bible but they don't believe in God. These are people that profess Christ but don't possess him. These are people that talk about the kingdom of God but don't want to live according to the plan of God. These are these lets, these proud clowns. Also, these are these nabels, these God-denying fools. I don't know how you can come to church every Sunday or Wednesday and yet not believe in God. See, a lets and a Nabel will always strive to check the box. My prayer to you this morning, those of you that are here, and those of you that would hear this CD, don't be a fool. Don't be a let's nor a Nabel. Be wise. Get to know God for yourself. Pray to God. It's bigger than you. Get to know that God loves you just the way you are, and he gave you the grace to get to know him. And all you have to do is don't be a fool. And if you can receive it, give God a hand praise in the house of God. As you stand to your feet.